Welcome to Gen Visibility interview series. We bring visibility to our genesis, geniuses, genealogy, generosity, and gentleness. You may feel isolated or alone, but you are not. We are a vibrant, thriving, creative, and amazing community. We are adventurers, trendsetters, and trailblazers. If you want to be part of Gen Visibility, please submit our form by visiting our website, genvisibility.com. Your voice matters, your story matters, and we cannot wait to see you shine. So you're Kate Stone, and you are, in your own words, I think, a creative scientist. Yeah, yeah, I made that up. It just, you know, um, there wasn't, I didn't, I couldn't find a title that fitted what I do because so often who I am, how I think, how I feel often covers what might be to many people two sides of a coin um, and, and things that don't necessarily go together. And sometimes it's very hard to put yourself in a box when some boxes are mutually exclusive you know it's like oh if you tick that box you're not allowed to tick that box but i feel very creative i'm very creative in my thinking in what i do but i'm also a scientist which also makes me quite literal and follow some rules but i'm both yeah. so i made up creative scientist to describe myself yeah, so, and also, you know you don't, when, you don't like boxes from what i can tell if somebody tells you you can't do this you're like oh okay thanks for the challenge <laughs> i'll take that on exactly exactly i think there's a there's a saying i think it might be japanese um and it's something like um um the person who says it can't be done should get out of the way of the person doing it exactly so yeah. i'm like get out of the way <laughs> that is very much i think a good motto for the way you approach life I, you're definitely obviously very left brain and right brain you get the rigor but you're very much a, a an inventor a creator a tinkerer and it sounds like you've had that yeah. in you your whole life so um you grew up all over the world and very much allowed to yeah. explore and you share in your tech talk that even as at a very young age you were fascinated with cables and uh, wires and electricity. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about growing up all over the world and how would that, how that was like and what was your family dynamic and this experience of so many cultures. And, you know, I, I'm just super curious because that's pretty amazing to grow up like that. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. And, you know, and on and on the boxes, it's it, it, again, it's like I seemed to tick every single different box, you know, um, in terms of how I grew up and where I grew up. So, you know, the you know, the first I mean, my first four years, we lived in the caravan in a mobile home <laughs> because my um, my parents had bought a house. So they used to live up in a city where I've learned that my family lived in the same city working in cotton mills for 200 years so you know i trace my family tree back for 200 years my family going back working in cotton mills you know like i was like whoa and then you know e even my mother and my grandmother you know and then and then they moved um to a house in the country and my dad was going to renovate that and um and so we lived in a caravan in the garden for the first four years of my life while while they you know, while my dad sort of rebuilt the house and so that was like the first part of my life um you know and then and i went to you know like local schools a local primary school a local comprehensive school and then you know my dad's career sort of developed working for an oil company abroad and then at that some point that involved us going to live where he worked which was in um, oman in the middle east um, so that then meant that I got shipped off to boarding school. So I, you know, and I went to a boarding school, um, which I, I really did not what like. What age? Um, can't remember, maybe 12 or something. And you were, that's in England, um, right? In, yeah, in England, in England and then Wales. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent my school time in a boarding school, sleeping at a boarding school, and then my holidays you know, there were long holidays because they're long holidays when you go to boarding school. Um, for the f for a few years, it was in, in Oman in the Middle East, which was amazing. So, you know, then the, the life changed and, you know, like, you know, I had a little sailing dinghy and a windsurfer and, you know, I'd gone from, from holidays that were just 
going to Wales and, you know, where we lived to something that was way, way, way more exotic. And, um, you know, and then I remember flying to, to these places with my sister, who was younger than me, um, it, on our own, you know, getting on a plane back then and flying to Oman was really quite adventurous because no tourists were allowed in. You had to have a special wow. visa. Um, and we went in and, you know, and then my dad worked out in the desert. So for some of the weeks we would go, we would fly out to where he worked in the desert and spend time out in the desert. And that was amazing. And, you know, I think the thing that my, my parents gave me that I recognized was of the most value to me was exposure to the world, ex exposure to places, to people, to things, to ways of life. Um, and, you know, just, just being around that, not knowing that that was unusual, because to me, this was just how I grew up. This is normal. You know, you go to the Middle East, you, you know, like to, to, to occupy me during the day while I was out in the desert, my dad would send me off with different people to do different things. So he'd go, today you're going to go with um, a paint inspector who inspects the inside of oil tanks out in the desert. So I'd spend all day driving around the desert just looking at these oil tanks, you know, or today you're going to go with the driver of a Kenworth truck. You know, those like huge semi-trailer trucks. And it just sent me off doing that. I'm like 14 or something, you know, I don't know what age, but that early teen. Um, and then the driver then let me have a go at driving this truck with like 24 gears or I don't wow. know how many gears it had. But I couldn't do it. And I went round a roundabout the <laughs> wrong way. And we got, I was going so slowly. We were overtaken by a forklift oh truck. Um, and then, you know, I also remember like another day we went out to visit a drilling platform. So, you know, I'm stood on a drilling platform in the desert next to the pipe doing the drilling like on the actual platform right next to the, the drilling thing um and, and and thinking this is just normal this is this is how you grow up um really i remember it being the seed of of adventure and just being always open like to discovering i mean it was already it seems in you but it definitely allowed you yeah. to connect with that part of you that just loves to experience new things and to yeah but i'm just thinking that that's normal right you know um i remember another time we were driving through the desert and then there was like this sort of like little tent thing and goats around it and we pulled up and we went in and it was some bedouin in, in the middle of the desert and we're sitting there eating dates and drinking the uh, you know the Ar arabian coffee um and from that, then my dad moved to Borneo, to Brunei. So the next thing you know, we live in a house on the edge of the jungle with monkeys wow. in the garden. And, um, and he got me a job working in a local mechanics place. So I was like with people like fixing cars and stuff. And that's perfect for you. And, and so, yeah, I know it was, it was, I mean, I don't know. I mean, one thing I've sort of come to conclude later on in life is that you know, like we have like left brain, right brain, as you, you know, you mentioned, I, I think we have, so we have two halves to our brain. I think we have two halves to our mind um, and an inner mind in our, you know, head and body. And, and the mind is not an organ. Um, you know, the brain is an organ. The mind, the mind is how we think. And then we have an outer mind and our outer mind is, is everything that is around us, everything that's around us, every space we go into, every object, every journey, every other person every creature you know a tree the leaves and and so we use what is around us to think and if you say to someone how do you have your best idea they might say oh when i'm in the shower or if i go for a walk or you know when i'm at the dinner table or chewing my pencil so i'm like well if you have your best ideas when you're you know doing those things and you use them to think then how can they not be part of your mind right that's a great uh, that's a great, uh, it's a great um, uh, perspective. And, and it makes me think a little bit about what you say in your TED talk. Uh, so when you're 20, you go to Australia, you end up in the middle of nowhere, uh, herding yeah. 20,000 sheep. I don't remember the yeah. number, but a, sh yeah. a, a big number of sheep. And you talk about how that experience was really about you know, finding ways to transform the environment so that the sheep do 
what you want them to do, which is like, yeah. you know, find their way to where you want them to go. And it wasn't forcing them. It was like supporting yeah. them through the change of environment. And then when you ended up doing your PhD back in England in physics and playing with electrons, you yeah. realize you're doing the same thing. So it sounds exactly. a little bit like that outside mind and the inside mind. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a realization that I've had probably since I did that talk, you know, because that was just me trying to get my head around it a little bit. Um, you know, and so I would say, yeah, we, we move the sheet by allowing without commanding and we move the electrons by allowing without commanding. So instead of trying to force something to happen, to force someone to believe what you believe, um, you, you need you need to change the experience that they have. You need to change what is around them, move a few things around. And because their environment is their mind, if you change their environment, you change their mind you change it's how they think such a great well, perspective you know I, I i do a lot of work in in healing like you know like kind of internal healing uh, based on yeah. trauma that was my last work and it's so interesting that so much of the focus is always internal and and how do you transform somebody's environment to to support their healing to support their changing in their yeah. self narrative or the nar narrative of their life it's it's just such a fascinating perspective i i really love yeah. it well, once, you know, once you start to get that, then you can see it, right? Right. And you can see it in so many, in so many little ways. So, you know, and it's mindset, right? We use the word mindset and we use the word stage set. So the stage set is everything on the stage. Mm -hmm. So mindset is everything on your stage, right? You know, and you change what's on the stage and the audience will perceive things in a different way. Constant you change what's around yeah. you, you know, if you, you know, if, if this, you know, I mean, just, um, if you remove notifications off your phone, it changes your behavior with your phone. Right. You know, if, if, oh, yeah. you, if, if you move where the chocolate biscuits are and put them one shelf up, it, it changes. You know, you move them out of your eye line, you're less likely to have them. So right. it's, it's very difficult and very stressful to force ourselves to have the self-control to do what we want to do. It's really hard because we evolved and grew up, you know, as humans in an environment where how we would think was with our environment, how we would eat, what we would eat, where we would go, what we would do, and all of those things, how we would exercise, all of those things, we're all, we, we, we are and were and have always been a part of our environment. Just like a spider and a web is what a whole spider is. A spider without a web isn't a spider. Well, they just had these studies, right? That like the spider is actually part of the, the web is part of the spider's intelligence. It's considered like, part of its brain. But like no shit Sherlock. I mean, no yeah. fucking shit Sherlock. <laughs> like, like, right. uh, it's, right. it, it's arrogant and ignorant to think that humans exist in the universe separate to the universe. Like, right are the universe like you, right. you are the universe right? right and and once you start to get that so moving things around choosing where choosing where you know you are and because we now live in a modern world very different to how we evolved and so to to to, to eat appropriately to communicate appropriately to exercise appropriately is something we have to use our brains to force ourselves to do and we don't, we find it really hard because we weren't built to do that. Right. We were built with almost just do what we wanted to do and whatever we wanted to do was the right thing. Right. Now it's not. So we have, so to, we have to change our environment. Right. Yeah. Change the environment. Yeah. Change the environment and, and it, cha it changes who you are. And so, you know, that then, you know, if you alter your environment, you become like a mind surgeon, right? <laughs> you can alter someone's mind. And if you want to see inside someone's mind. Well, advertisers have, have known that a long time, right? And, and marketing right. folks, unfortunately, have been using that against us. And we, we've learning more and more about that, in, 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 including in, in the terrible politics, uh, political manipulating yeah. that are going yeah. on. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to your childhood for a second and describe the way you do in the TED talk, you as a child tinkering with this wire, because I, I bet you there's a lot of children who are going to listen to this or a teenager is going to be like, that's me, right? Like I'm, I'm that tinkerer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just, I've just like always been curious about how things work, you know, and things around me. Um, I, I was really good at pulling apart the toys. Actually, I was really good at pulling apart my brother and sister's toys. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wasn't very good at putting them back together. <laughs> but 
but I wanted to see what was inside, you know, and how they worked and, and what, you know, and what I could use things for. And, and you know, and, and I would always, I was always doing these things, though, more often to create an experience. So, you know, it wasn't ever really about the technology. It was about how I could use it, what experience I could create. So, yeah, I remember doing a thing with the microphones and the switches. So I would, I would like hide little speakers, um, you know, behind books and um, and then I'd run wires down the walls and then have a microphone and I'd hide under my bed or in the loft <laughs> space. And then with the switches, I'd make my voice come from different parts of the room. And so my brother and sister wouldn't know where I was and I would just really confuse them. <laughs> and it was just a very strange thing to do. But I did it to create that experience, not really, it wasn't really ever about the tech, you know. I, I always did things because because I could, not necessarily because I should. Yeah. Um, and I also, um, I mean, these things are so much easier now, right? I mean, back then it was it, it wasn't easy to do to, to do many of these things. You could do so much now with an iPhone. Um, but I got one of my dad's favorite books, which was called Captain Hornblower, and I carved out the insides of the book. And from the back page of a magazine, um, I ordered a radio transmitter um and so the the kit came and you had to solder it all and build the whole thing and i hid the radio transmitter inside the book and then i placed the book next to my parents and then i crept off to my bedroom and i tuned in my radio um and i could hear yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe you, you heard got more than, than than what you were don't do yeah. that <laughs> don't do that it, 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 it's taught me you know it's it's more difficult to unhear <laughs> than it is to hear yes well you know the, the connection now, between yeah. your your those experiment and what you do in your business right now so you have this you've created this uh, uh basically this this uh incredibly creative business where uh and i'm gonna i'm gonna probably say it wrong but you you take paper and printing and you uh, you add this interactive element where people can touch and create sound and music and just all of this interactive potential using, again, yeah. wire I, I have and one electricity. Here. Go ahead, show us. So this is um, an intergalactic alien music remixing rap battle. <laughs> <laughs> And when you touch it, oh, I've turned it on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just a poster. It's amazing. And you collaborated with, um, sorry, you collaborated with a, a, a musician to create a, their album for their, yeah. uh, well, the cover of their album. Um, yeah, so this was for DJ Qbert. Amazing. And then inside, so we made this whole thing. And then inside, these are paper thin DJ decks. Wow. And they're Bluetooth. Um, and they pair with your phone and you can scratch and mix and, and you know so my, my favorite my favorite sound effect is the air horn so i like bah, 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 bah. Very, very much like uh, a uh in reggae in a dance hall reggae right they always use yeah. uh the, the 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 that horn um it's really it's really fun and i and i know that you enjoy you know collaborating with really creative people so this is a really great part of yeah. your work is that you don't just create really interesting objects that are uh, interesting and interactive but you get to collaborate with tons of different people. yeah yeah and we've done lots of things with different brands um you know so for pizza heart we made the the box into dj decks um for mcdonald's we turned the tray liner in the restaurant you know the piece of paper that goes in the tray into something that you can recreate music and we did a little box for ikea that when you touched it triggered the sounds of the home and made like a music remix wow. um yeah I, yeah and worked with a few musicians as, as well um i made um i made a poster earlier on this year for for a, an artist that i know called bootsy collins um he he's he's like one of the world's best bass players um he was in james brown's band wow. so you know like that history um and i made a little poster for him that he asked me to post to jimmy fallon um and then jimmy fallon opened his show 
with my poster wow. and said, this is from Dr. Kate Stone. So that was kind of cool. That is, that is so <laughs> great. And are you, is this, um, I just feel like you being who you are, like it all, it feels like it's only one thing that you're going to do that you're going to create another three different like re reinvent yourself another three times or does that feel like because of all the interaction and 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 uh collaboration that it's it's satisfying enough that this might be it this is this is what you're gonna do for a long time yeah you know there's also i want to do all sorts of things and it's just frustrating not being able to do all the things i want to do you know that's that's probably the biggest challenge that, yeah. that I face. Yeah, you're really you know, overflowing is, with life and passion and intellectual curiosity, uh, which is and humor. It's yeah, such a great I, combination. And I, I, I am very fortunate to have had my mind opened, you know, and you know that that's the thing that I don't know. I mean, maybe not everyone reacts in the same way, but that's what I realized was like I said, the number one thing my parents gave me was was just to let me explore some of the world. And, and that literally expanded my mind. Right. Everywhere you've been, everywhere you go, literally, not figuratively, expand your mind, you know. The world and, of possibilities. And so I'm very lucky that, yeah, I, you know, that I had that. And so and my way of reacting to that is thinking, is thinking someone like me can do something like that. Right. And and I and I think that is one of the most important things, is for when you've had the privilege of going somewhere, being somewhere, meeting people, seeing things, and just feeling that okay, I'm not that person now. I'm not doing this thing now. I don't have those things now, but I've been there once. So my job is to find a way to get back there again. Just. Right. But when you've never, you know, now you can imagine, you right? That. You get a, you get a, you can't. It's hard to imagine things you don't know exist, right? If you haven't, right. Seen, right? You, you have to know that it's out there in the world that somebody can do this, and, and that someone like you can right. do that and go Absolutely. there. Absolutely. You know, I interviewed a couple of, um, um, I interviewed a bunch of people earlier on this year to make posters. I took portrait photos of them. I made posters of them, and you touch the portrait, and then you hear little sound bites. Of them and their life mm. and i interviewed a bunch of young people um in upstate new york um and 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 two of them were two girls two young girls who were who those family or they were originally from mexico and i asked them what did you want to do when you grow up and they both and they were interviewed separately and they both said the same thing they wanted to be an astronaut and i said well so what do you want what do you think you can do now do you still want to be an astronaut and they said oh no no someone like me can't be an astronaut mm. And, and it made, I just wanted to cry, yeah, you yeah. know? And, and so what do you want to do? And they said, a kindergarten teacher, which is a, also a great right. thing to do. If that's what you but want. The reason right. they, <laughs> but the reason they said it is because that's probably the only positive influence they've had right. in their life and exposure to that they can see, oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, young people, whether that whatever, that wherever they're from, whether they're trans or, or whatever, need to have an exposure to role models so that they can go oh someone like me can do something like right. that because they all can but if you don't believe you can then you're right yes you can't right. you don't even have you if you can't imagine it forward it's very hard to follow that path i know just growing up yeah. in, in a in a very conservative country and household um and having really no female role model out there, uh, you know, all, only the men did the exciting things. Uh, it was very yeah. hard to imagine, um, you know, that kind of future for myself. So I, I, we, I think we know for a fact now that representation in every way we can have it, right? In movies, in 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 books, in children's book is is so critical, and it's still not enough. What's happening in that level? I just wanted to ask you. Um, uh, one of the, the second tech talk that you, do, do you mind sharing your age? You don't have to, but if you don't, if you're comfortable, I forget, I sometimes forget. More or less. <laughs> are you in your fifties? I think I'm 52. 52. Now. Okay. So you are in your fifties. Yeah, but I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, I was, you know, I was born at a young age. <laughs> I, you know, I was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I was wondering because I, how long ago did you have that, that, uh, uh, life, threatening accident um i think it's about 
I don't know, about five, five years, years ago. ago. So anyway, in, in one yeah. of your TED Talk, which will be linked to the website, where you talk about uh, going on a walk in, in the countryside and uh, a very large deer with hand, antlers, right? Is that the right description? Because I, mm-hmm. um, I had to look it up because I don't know the word that you use. Um, uh, literally gored you right in the throat yeah. and you thought yeah. you were going to die. And there's several yeah. things that really fascinated me about this story. And it's a really amazing story. I'd like everyone to, to watch it. Um, one is that when this happened, you had this kind of Zen like perspective where you were just focusing on every breath and allowing yourself to just be in the moment, which I don't understand, Mm -hmm. do not understand how you can do that. Second, um, you had this three months of recovery, uh, where you Mm -hmm. literally had the gift of not coming, only coming back to life, but of finding your voice again. And I think the metaphor is huge because not only did you find your voice Uh back as, as a person, you had to, to find your voice again as, you know, a trans woman, because this whole thing happened where they, they stempled on your privacy. And I'd love for you to talk a bit about that because it's, the, the, and then the amount of compassion, like you're, but there's two things. There's not just compassion. There's like this fight see, just I'm going to get my revenge spirit, right? Like I'm going to yeah. show them who they messed with. But then on the other side yeah. of this, there's also this really kind of uh, loving kindness, you know, uh, perspective of like, you know, you make friend with your enemy, you come to things with a very big open heart and you transform again, the environment that you live in versus yourself so sorry i kept talking but go ahead and share if you can no no it's fine it's fine and you know and the, i'm sort of hearing this there's two parts there you know one is how, how was i so zen then in that moment you know i'm i'm you know um i'm really good when things are really bad um and i'm not very good when things are just a little bit bad you know so my phone's about to run out of battery or i might be late or you know there's not enough milk left i get all stressed and i'm like you know i'm all stressed and i'm all worried about it and i can't just calm down and it's like it's going to be okay you know but if something really bad happens i'm like okay okay i really gotta <laughs> i gotta stay still there's no time to panic you know there's no time to panic and and when um you know, it was midnight, it was pitch black. I never saw the deer hit me. The stag came out of the darkness and hit me. I never saw it. So all I know is I felt a big thud and I fell to the floor. And when I tried to shout for help, it came out of my throat. So there's a hole in my throat. So I know I'm lying on the floor and my throat's been cut. And, you know, that was terrifying because, you know, what goes to my mind is like, okay, how am I still alive and if I move if I move I could die so you know like like I'm like I have to stay very 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 still um I have to stay I had no choice I had to stay very still if I panicked it would kill me and you know, I go out into the wilderness a lot. So some people vote, oh, the city slicker doesn't know how to be in the country, you know, and all the rest of it. It's like I was walking home from the pub with some friends. I wasn't, you know, we were in a countryside pub and I was walking with local people to their garden at night. And, you know, and and a deer was trapped in their right. garden, their mistake, and they opened the gate and it ran out and they never saw it it escaped and it just ran down the path and I was the first person on the path and it hit me. So I didn't, you know, nothing I right. could do. Um, but I'm used to being out in the wilderness. You know, I, I go hiking on my own. Like, you know, like I mean, a couple of years ago, I went hiking in Montana for three days, two nights, sleeping out in Montana, hiked from 7,000 to 9,000 feet um, in the winter. Um, and I'm sleeping in my hammock and there are grizzly bears, wow. wolves, mountain lions. I'm absolutely terrified and I'm worried about it all night. But I know if I panic, if you panic, you die. Right. And so I knew I, I had no choice, you, you know, because that's kind of like the different parts of me are kind of tick different boxes. Yeah, I'm like all creative and passionate and whatever. But then I'm very analytical. So I'm like, if you move, you will die. If you panic, you will die. So you, you realize it it's not just like the right thing to do. It's your survival instinct that just kicked in. Yeah. Yeah. And right. Exactly. And the same, the same, you know, the same for the newspapers. So, you know, I read what they wrote in those headlines and, and I was furious. Can you share, can you you share? Cause it's really right. It. 
can, can you share some of the headlines or you prefer not to? I mean, I will. I just don't No, like then don't. It. It's I fine. Just, yeah. You know, no, I will. I mean, you know, they wrote on the front page of the newspaper in Scotland, sex swap scientist gored by yeah. stack. And, you know, and then in the newspaper articles, they print like former name and when I had an operation oh and that I'm trying to. And, and like, you know, their excuse was, oh, if they Google me and they go to the Cambridge University website under diversity, I did an interview about being transgender, which I did because the university's diversity group asked if I would do an interview to be an example of one of, you know, 12 or 15 people who were from different backgrounds to show prospective students that someone like them could right. go to Cambridge. So I did that for those right. types of people to see, you know, whereas a newspaper article read by the person who might be a little right wing sat next to me in the hot tub at the local yeah. gym. <laughs> need to know. Slightly you know, different they, experience, they right? They don't. They don't need no. to know. They don't need to know. Not because it's a secret, right. but because it's it's information that's just not pertinent to the experience right. they're having right. with me. Absolutely, it's, it's your privacy. It's not a secret. Yeah, and it's not secret. It's just not relevant in that right. context you know they don't need to know you know what what color pants i'm wearing they like people just don't it's it's you know they don't, don't need to know what my hat size is it's just it's not relevant information you know it's it's irrelevant and 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 you know the media was still caught up in thinking that if someone's transgender that's what you define right. them as and you don't. And you don't for a couple of reasons. You don't because it's not fair on that person. And also you're telling 10 million people that if you come across a transgender person, you ask them what their name was. You ask them when their operations were. You ask, you know, that th th they're saying that the first thing you need to know about someone if they're trans is, is you need to know right. that. You setting you, you you're setting up the standard the approach to dealing yeah. and, and 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 interacting with a trans person that is just totally inappropriate. It's totally inappropriate, and they those newspapers did that, and it made me really furious. And um, but 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 I was furious for a minute, you know, a figurative minute. It's probably a week, um, <laughs> you know. But then and so there's then. I can then see a kinder way of doing it, which is the nice thing to do. But then the more analytical part of me is kind of like, I can manipulate them with kindness. They won't know what's hit yeah. them. Um, and, and, you know, they will do exactly what I right. want. You, you were, you were <laughs> so, hurting them <laughs> into yeah. the exact place was, you wanted them to be, which is to invite exactly. you to actually now be part of uh, the people who get to speak on the appropriate and ethical behavior, right? What is that? What is that? That what is that? Yeah. So about? I sit. Yeah, it's called the Editors Code of Practice Committee, and it's a body that the newspaper industry, most of them in the UK, subscribe to, to regulate right. themselves. So I sit on the committee that reviews right. the rules by what the newspapers have So you to were very by. successful then, at hurting them. The other part that I love is that, so not only, so you have this whole strategy in mind, you're you're the expert at, at creating the environment, right? To change the people. So you <laughs> here you are like planning, you know, this thing for months, cause you're at the hospital for months, like, you know, or, or, or relearning to speak and whatnot and, and to be independent. And then you write these letters, the newspaper agreed to speak with you. They come to the conclusion that they were wrong. They think they're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, the day after you get the apology, um, you're on all of the major TV shows. And I guess, you know, other ways yeah. saying, you know, they apologize because they were wrong. And, and you have your own headlines yeah. ready to go, which are fabulous. Go ahead and tell, tell you know, speak up. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's it's kind of that, you know, I, I don't know, I just try to understand. So first of all, first of all, you have to listen to other people and you have to understand yep. them. You have to listen to the other side. So, you know, I had to imagine, I had to get myself to the place where I could go, had my life followed a different mm -hmm. path, 
and I'd ended up working for a newspaper and I had I not been trans I could imagine myself writing those same right. headlines so I can't be judgmental and think oh these are bad people they are me who's followed a different path and so first of all I have to understand them and why they do what they do you can't shout at people and say you're wrong you're a bad person you shouldn't do this it's like no it's like I understand how you came to that conclusion but allow me to show you how it feels from my mm -hmm. side this is how that made me feel this is the impact that that had on right. my life you're not a bad person for doing that I understand why you did that but look at what it kind of accidentally made happen and then they're kind of like oh my god go oh, okay wow okay you know then they felt bad you know Th then they felt bad and so you know then they were like they were like we're sorry it's like i'm sorry like we're sorry i'm like oh <laughs> you're sorry okay just, just write that Say it down louder. for me just write, that down. just write it down it's like and then they wrote it down and then i just blew it up like they're sorry <laughs> they're sorry <laughs> <laughs> and i went on the news and the newspaper articles and you know right and, and you um, got to you know tell and, the and, world like that why it's not appropriate so yeah. it wasn't just getting a personal sorry but the whole idea was that again if this is setting a standard on how you approach uh, people that are trans or non-binary, um, now you're publicly saying, no, that is not. And you're explaining why it's not. And you're, you're you know, uh, correcting it at the same level, at the same public loudness level that they yeah. did. And the important thing is, is that not that they say they're sorry. The important thing is that they feel right. sorry. The important thing is not that they say they were wrong, it's that they feel right. And if you had attacked them they legally, right? If you it. had to attack them legally, which is what people expect, then they would have just shut themselves down and be like, Well, what what does she expect? Yeah. Right? That's our job. But instead, yeah. you really like help them connect with you, you know, meet with you, see you as a person, and that allows them to to feel. That's really powerful. Yeah. And yeah, but and the thing is, once you once I had the realization that this is the most effective way to do it, then that, that's that's how I'm going to do it. I'm not, you know, I'm do, it's like, oh, I'm being kind, I'm being big hearted. And, and I am. But at the same time, I also realize for me, it's the most right. effective tool that I it's can It's funny, use. you know, as a parent, I'm always talking to my kids about strategies. <laughs> I'm like, that strategy is not going to get you what you want. But it's like, it's so hard. We're so attached to our strategy. We're angry, we scream, not going to get you what you want, you know? But it's just so, you know, it's a little bit what you said about like, uh, changing the environment. If we, if we see the cookies, we eat the cookies. It's very hard to resist, you know, our or our instinctive or internal reaction to things to really yeah. choose strategies. And it's, it's, it's interesting that this scientific temperament of yours or the scientific training has allowed you to just really take your time and, and pick strategies so that you can get where you want. Um, yeah. well, well, so there's, there's two, you know, as well as having two minds, there's also, there's also two other parts of us that we have. And, <clears throat> I met an alchemist in the forest a bunch of years ago, and he explained the difference to me between spirit and soul. And, and again, like brain and mind, I thought they were two words for mm -hmm. the same thing, and they're not. You know, and I always thought spirit and soul were two words for the same thing. And, and his perspective on that, my memory of his explanation, which I may have it wrong, and now I have my own version, was that <clears throat> the spirit is, um, is more the chemicals within us, and our spirit is more what we're born with. So the spirit is more inherent to our physicality okay. in our body. It's, it's, it's chemicals that are released to make us have spirited right. reactions. And they're, they're usually on a very short time right. scale. So, you know, fear and anger and like, or you can suddenly like run or jump over something or say something. And so the spirit is more like the it's child right. inside. Of, yeah, you know, and everything has right. a spirit. So plants have mm -hmm. spirits. You know, and if you just and you distill something down, you get left with the okay. spirit. So, you know, you distill a potato, you get left with spirit, which is vodka and a spirit is fiery. So if you light it, it sets on fire. That's why spirit is fiery. And that's what the spirit mm -hmm. is in, in something. And then the other is, is, is our soul. And our soul is more a soul isn't any isn't a chemical. It isn't anything physical. Our soul is more like the software that runs on the whole of our body, the whole of our body. So there's the soul. Our soul is is like sits on top of everything 
and it has a longer time scale of reacting to things and doing things. So the soul is not really, it's something we may be born with or not, but our soul is something that we grow throughout our lives based on our experience and based on the love that other people give us. It allows us to grow mm -hmm. our soul. Someone who maybe is not allowed to grow like that can be quite mean spirited, mm -hmm. not very soulful, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't really have much of a soul, is very react reactionary, thinks everything's about them. You know, you can imagine a certain orange person that's like that, doesn't have much of a soul, was never given a chance right. to grow their soul. But, so the soul is like the parent and the spirit likes to know that there's a soul in charge that's going to keep mm -hmm. them in check. And so we have to, you know, realize that we have these very instant reactions and we have to learn to allow our spirit to do a little bit of something. But then we, we have to know that no matter how we feel, we need to just take some time out and leave a little gap, let the spirit and calm down and then allow the soul right. to come in and, and then us. have a strategy and, and make right. some plans. I love yeah, it. that's the difference between spirit yeah, and soul. I love it. You're like a Renaissance <laughs> woman with like, you know, you, you have this, 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 interact internet intercon ah this just whole vision of of you know philosophical scientific you know neurological it's like you you really see all the connection it's wonderful <laughs> um i wanted to ask you two things where you know it, first of all um uh i wanted to ask you i just forgot instantly what i was going to ask you but i i know i want to move into talking about um, your journey as a trans woman. Um, so this is not the most mm -hmm. important about you thing about you by far. Clearly, we just could keep talking about all these other places in your life. But, you know, but it is one of these aspects that has definitely shaped who you are. And so I am curious to talk about it, especially considering, you know, who, who this video is for. Um, and yeah. I wanted to ask you before even going there to kind of speak speak to what you said, you know, people need to see themselves in the future, you know, like children have to see themselves, people like them. And, you know, clearly seeing such a vibrant and, and successful tinkerer, scientist, creator is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear a little bit about also your private life, N not in any details that you want to share, but like, I think that we, you know, that they can see like a vibrant person. Like, what is your life like? Where do you live? Do you still travel a lot? What makes you alive besides your work? Like, tell me a bit about, so I can have, so as a child, I could have a visual of like, oh, you know, when I'm in my fifties, I could be, you know, not only rocking my business world, but like, here's what life could be like. Oh, I'm probably not a good example. I have a strange no, life. It's good. Um, I, I mean, I, I still don't feel like I've grown up yet. I still haven't like made it. I still haven't like got there. I still, you know, so <clears throat> um, I I got in my head about six years ago that I wanted to, because I lived in Cambridge for a long time. I was originally from the north of England and, you know, and I got in my head that I wanted to move to the USA. Um, so I just got it in my head. I want to move to New York. So, and I was in New York and, um, and I said to a professor that a professor reached, saw my TED talk and, had reached out to me and wanted to chat and I got and I'd known him for a few years at that point and I said oh he's a professor at NYU uh, and I said I'm thinking of moving to New York and he's like oh great okay I'll sort that out for you I was like hang on what do you mean I was, he's, he's like he's like Look, it, we don't need to talk about it just just send me your CV send me your passport um and um he made me into a visiting scholar at New York University in the music education Amazing. department um I can't play a musical instrument and I don't have any qualifications in education, but they really liked what I did and they just wanted me to be there and be around. Um, and I got to, and so they sorted out my, my wow. visa. Um, I got to rent um, a place in Washington Square in New York City that was, you know, academic price. And a few months later, I, I moved to New York. So I lived in New York for a couple of years um and and in new york city for a couple of years but i but i really love the mountains and the countryside um so and, and at the weekends i was um so i deal with living in the city which i love the city but it's also very intense so i deal with that and get balanced by at the weekends i get my backpack and i get on the train and i go upstate and then i i, I walk from the train station out into the forest i take my hammock and i walk out into the forest for five hours, eight hours, and then I build a fire, put my hammock up, 
and then I sit in the forest and then you know and I'd stay there for the night and and it you know I, I'm not sure where 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 you're based but um it gets pretty cold there in the winter so it gets to minus twenty um um and um you know and there's coyotes howling and and it's quite scary um but you know but I but that's what I would do at the weekends and and so after two years um I decided to move upstate so I moved to a place called the Catskills. Um, which is a more mountainous area and it's two hours from the city um, and I found a house I could rent on a mountain and then work with my colleagues back in the UK you know over phone Skype and, and whatever and um, and then my daughter who was based in the UK she then moved over so she joined me when she was 19 so she's lived with me now for two years Great. Um, um, so yeah we lived together we lived together upstate um on the mountain and, and there there's like oh i wish i i could show you the images but there's like 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 bears like a bear came to the window of the house and you know there's this, this crazy nature out there. there's all sorts of animals it's great there's a raccoon keeps coming and stealing things from us and it's like wearing a mask over its eyes but you know that's what raccoons do that's great. um and um but then a few months ago our landlady decided to sell the house that we lived in um and there's covid um you know and that was like really scary so so we didn't know what to do so she eventually sold the house she sold the house about two weeks two three weeks ago um so and and you know there's a headline in the in washington we lived in woodstock in the catskills there's a headline in the washington post about woodstock and new york city leave people leaving and buying houses in woodstock and it being the high, the highest house price wow. rise in the country so we had to leave we we oh. had to leave so we put everything in storage um um and um put a big bag on the roof of the car this is like just over a, two weeks ago now um and i say we hitched our trailer to the wagon and we wow. drove west so um we got in our car and we drove for 10 days 3200 miles to la and this is where we are now we're a new in, we're adventure in LA. so yeah. Just another and adventure, you know, and we drove across amazing. the country and we had I mean, all you're, sorts you're of You're just adventures. A, a natural adventurer and, and you just, just, you take, you take, <laughs> you take these uh, steps that would feel so overwhelming to most of us, but you just take them with so much ease, going to Australia, moving to the US, going across the country. It's wonderful. Um, what? Well, it will be okay. Right. It will, it will work out. It will right. be okay. You know, and, and I'll tell you my greatest fear in life is right. regret my greatest fear in life is being older no longer able to do things i wanted to do at the time and the only reason i didn't do them is because i I'm was wondering, too scared is... the thought of being older right. and unable to i am terrified so you, of that. you know is it, it, it with this spirit in mind um was the transition like was coming out and and telling yourself telling the world that you're trans was that yet another adventure that we was like oh i can take that on or did that feel like a much a much different kind of adventure no that was no that was awful it was it was the scariest thing i've ever done in my life um i you know i um and it, and for me it was only just over 10 years ago so you know i was about 40 just mm -hmm. late 30s which is not you know i mean it's it's over a decade ago now i guess but <clears throat> For me, it's a secret that I'd held inside since my very, very, very first memory. You know, my very, f I won't go into that, but my very first memory is knowing and feeling that, not knowing what trans meant, but knowing whatever I knew back when we were still living in that caravan when I was very young. So I know I was less than four years old because um, <clears throat> I, you know, have a memory of that. Um, and, and, and that being a secret that I've had my whole life and is you know, as we always say, it was. Oh, it used to be more difficult. Is you know, and and it was more difficult because there's no there's no internet, there's no role models. There's you don't even know what the word. Never heard of the word trans. Don't know what any of it means. You just know there's something you feel different, and different to everyone around. And so, in, I felt because I knew no example, incredibly ashamed of myself, and I felt for my whole life until that point. If anyone, I don't want to be too dark, but you know, I felt 
if anyone finds out, then I'm not going to be able right. to carry on living. Yeah, that is no, how no, I, no, felt. I understand that. that. There's no future, no future for me beyond that because there is no way that's that I there's no way that I can be trans and still have a life and be accepted in the community I live in and still have a life, still have a home, still have a job, still have friends, still have any dignity. There's 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 no like what am I who am I going to become? You know, right. what will I look like? Like there's there's no I cannot the see of this. an option. There's no path. There's right. no there's And the no other life. side turns out to be so no. fabulous, but you had no way of knowing that. And so you had to enter this this <sighs> this whole thing with so what what decided you to take that step if it was such a not only unknown, but such a scary thing to do, considering the cost that you imagined for yourself. I didn't have any choice because the person I was with found out, and that was one of the most awful moments of my life, really, How did... of being mm -hmm. with someone. They found partner. that in the sense that they um, found that that you... That that's how you felt inside, or okay, we don't need to go in details. But basically, yeah. they, they found yeah, they figured out that something but... was up, and you needed to confront yeah. it with yourself at that point. Well, I, I you know, I mean, I tried to hide. I tried to not hide. I tried to. Yeah, it's kind of personal, but you know, I basically, you know, my partner knew, and then, yeah, I um, it's difficult to talk about because I, I I don't want to say anything that's not yeah no i hear you else. well we don't have so, to go into detail yeah. but like do you so you were a little bit pushed to the force to to move forward with this and and did, were you yeah but then i spent the next i spent the next two years we sort of living separately and not acting on being right. trans at all two years of trying to pretend it wasn't a thing and trying to right. deny it in my head and then what happened and then that became too difficult. then i had to just leave I had to leave. And then I spent a few months, you know, still not doing anything or transitioning and everything. And then I realized I, I've lost my family. I've lost my friends. I, my, my company was just me on my own. I have no family, no friends, no future, no, lost everything. I'm right. totally on my own, right. totally on my own. And so I'm like, well, I've lost everything now. So, you know, I just decided to try and, and move yourself. forward and, you know, yeah, you know, and the way it is in the UK is, you know, is you, you have to live in the gender you feel you are for two years without any any that's hormones crazy. or anything. So that's what I had to do. And um, for two years, at least, every single day, somebody would, like, shout at me, laugh at me, cross the street to oh confront me hit me every single day I every single day I left my door I mm. received abuse for two years and you know there was a small group of mainly older trans women who met in a bar in the corner of a gay bar on the edge of town and once a month they would go for a meal in a restaurant <clears throat> and they'd let the local police know they were going wow. to go for a meal and to make sure it was safe I'm like I, I you know, I, I just, I, that, that can't be my future. I, I can't do that. So I decided <clears throat> that I would go to the biggest bar in the middle of Cambridge with the brightest lights and sit there on my own and assert my place in the world. You know, the only thing I could do was exist, present myself, just be present no matter what people would take ice out of their drinks and throw it at the back of my head and tap me on the shoulder to get me to look so all their friends could laugh i used to have to wear a wig um i haven't had my hair cut for a year because of covid so this looks like a wig not at all and they oh like my pull my wig off and <clears throat> i even got arrested and thrown in jail one night um <clears throat> you know and then there's another bar i went to so i'm getting a cough now <clears throat> I went to a bar um, after I'd been arrested and released and whatever, you know, and then the same thing, um, you know, I was arrested, released, because I did, didn't do anything wrong. Someone attacked me and they tried to pretend it was me who attacked them. Um, and I went back to the police a week later and then the police inspector came and they apologized to me and they all realized they were wrong. So, you know, I'd learned that that, that works 
you know, before. And the same with the bar, right. you know, the bar that that happened to, I went back and then the security came and they tried to throw me out again. And, you know, they were really rude to me. So I, I reported them to the police and I reported them to the company who owned the bar. And they came to visit me on my work and um, spoke to them. And then they said, would you help us do our diversity training? So I then had to go in at six o'clock in the evening back to this nightclub and they owned two nightclubs and they had like 16 door staff came to listen to me speak. And I told them I'm a scientist and what I do. I told them I'm a parent and about my kids. Um, and I told them that I'm also trans and sometimes people bully me and are mean to me. And their reaction was, was like, wow, that ever happens in here. You know, we totally not allow that. We'd look after you and all the rest of it because then right. they got to see me as a scientist and a parent, something that they themselves right. aspired to be. So they saw me as something aspirational. And then I said, I'm trans. And then they felt that they were protecting right. their own. Um, and from then on, it was fine, you know, and the same thing happened in another bar, you know, I, I got carried out by my arms and legs, and I'm on the phone to the police while I'm sort of being carried out and oh a police God. car, right, you know, that, that's what, that's what it was like, it's, you know, it's but, so, but it's so, I would right. go it's, back. I'd it's go back, incredible to me that you, know? you did this, that you took your space and you said, I'm not going to hide, I'm not going to live in shame, even though... Yeah. You, I mean, you don't, there's nothing in you that speaks shame, right? You seem to inhabit your space with so much joy. It's hard to imagine that inner shame. And yet, and, and you had, it was early in your transition. You had all this shame still to deal with. And yet in the world, you're stepping in with so much power. It's, it's very, it's very surprising and, and also very inspiring. I wonder if, what you think about that. Well, it's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, as I said before, like my biggest way of fear in life is regret. So, you know, and that's why I had to transition because, you know, what was in my head was, um, you know, first of all, was at, at 40, I don't, I don't want to not do at 40 what I knew I should have done at 30 that I didn't do right. when I was 20, you know? So there's years of compounded right. regret and then letting people down all along the way of you know of of people that feeling they've been lied to and misled right. and deceived when well, no, it's not i'm just i'm just hiding something that's shameful don't understand and i thought would go away i thought oh it will go away this is you know so what i i have this thing in my head and therefore i now can't have a life and i have right. to equally hide it you know you think it's going to go away so you know so there's this sort of compounded regret and and you know and so my biggest fear in life is regret and so it's like well I'm not going to be this person that hides away and sits in the corner and, you know, and more whatever. Shame, and, 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 uh, more secrecy. Yeah. No, it's like, no, I'm like, like I've lost everything. No right. friends, no nothing. If I'm going to do this, so if I'm going to I'm gonna do it right. Yeah. yeah. Like everything else you touch, right. You're going to do it fully. And so how is it on, right. Just assert, hold your space, hold your space, hold your space. Hold your space. That that is hold your fucking space. And excuse my language, but hold your your space, and and then in that space, project who you are. Project who you are. Do not project what you are in someone else's mm -hmm. eyes. So you know, I like if there's a list list of ten things that I am, plus more, anything that's not on the top ten doesn't make the mm -hmm. list of who I am. So there's lots of things that I am, right? For everyone, they have a list of 100 mm -hmm. things who they are, but the top 10 are who they are. So so being trans is not in my top 10, therefore I'm not trans. If it, that it, makes it sense. Is, I'm not denying right, no, I'm it, trans. It's, it's just, just not, 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 right, it's just just not, not what life. every day makes your heart, you know, vibrate. It's just not what keeps you interested and alive in the world. I, I, I understand that. And on the other hand, it's hard to understand that fully considering how much it's shaped you, right? Like if I did my 10 li list of 10, I think I would mention being a woman, not because that's, you know, it just has so little to do with my daily life in, in most ways, but because it's shaped so much of, of what, you know, I'm dealing with today, I still feel oh. like I, it's a big part of me. So I find it interesting. I'm not challenging it whatsoever, right? I'm just finding it interesting that considering no. the trauma that you experienced for these two years and the shame that you experienced for the 40 mm. years before that, 
that it still doesn't make your list is is it, I think speaks to how how strong of a core identity you have. And I think that's probably, you know, what keeps carrying you through each one of these stages of your life is it's all this passion yeah. and interest. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, exactly. I, you know, I mean, I can call it top three. I mean, you know, and then it's, you know, it, you know, it's, 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 it's really a mindset, and it's a way, it's a way of, it's a way of making. It's a right. tool for me. It's a tool for me to make sure that when someone hits me, the first thing they see right. is my personality and and everything yeah. else about me, and then they finally might realize I'm trans. But by then, they've yeah. already formed an opinion, and it's just important to not right. No, I that hear you, first. and so. Yeah. Further down the no, list. no, I, I, That's I, I, I love that. When, when you, um, now that you're on the other side and you've fully transitioned, you, you've, you're inhabiting yeah. with, you know, your, your true self. Uh, how is it now that you're, you're not in the, in that, in that transition, but you're also not in the shamey hiding place of not wanting to, to acknowledge yourself or the world, uh, your truth. How is it to be <laughs> now in this, on the other side? How do you feel about it? I mean, at the most boring level, it right. just feels just really you. normal. So, you know, the yeah, you know, I mean, it just, it's not like, it's not like, Oh wow. <laughs> now I'm a lady. And now I feel like, you know, it's like it, it, it's not that at all. It's, it's like having, you know, a massive thorn in my arm or something. And then someone You're removes like, that thorn. And now I don't feel like, oh, right. I just feel normal. <laughs> well, there is like, I guess I there just, is that, like, you know, it's like with I, your accident, I, when you first regain your independence and you could talk, you were yeah. in, you know, in, in a, a, a state of, of intense gratefulness for your, but at some point you're just back to be alive with all of the <laughs> difficulties of being alive versus continue yeah. it's you know so like the, yeah. at the beginning the thorn is removed and you feel so so much relief but eventually that's just the new normal yeah and 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 everyone's different and everyone has a different purpose right so but you know the point of transition is to transition and so it's really important for most people to not get lost right. in transition you know to become to have your whole life become because to become defi defining yourself as trans and that your whole everything is about being trans whether that's about being an activist or wanting other people to know and you know because it's it's quite a big deal and it can get you quite a lot of attention and it can get you quite a lot of love and you know in a, lots of positive ways and it can end up defining who you are in every moment and so i think it's important for most people to not get lost in transition and not allow themselves to become as being defined as trans for right. most people. Right. Not for everyone. For of course, there are, have there is a need for activists, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, there are women who have Absolutely. spent their whole life fighting for, for equal rights for women. There are people of color that, that, you know, are not defined by their, you know, identity, but that do choose exactly. to spend their life fighting for, for equal yeah. treatments, equal rights, especially, et cetera, et cetera. So I understand that some, some people might take that path, but, but right, not it's for not everyone. for everyone. That is not your. Yeah. And also there's a transition, you know, you don't have a, you don't, you might not have a transition of, you know, becoming a person of color or becoming a woman, you know, you might have a transition of, of being accepted for that. But, and so what I mean is to, is to embrace the transition, get through to the other side, really know who you are, become who you are, find your, you know, your thing that's defined beyond that. And then you can come back right, to right. being an activist I and see, to letting yeah. people know. And telling, it's, it's a healthier place for, for you right. to get to, to get, right. get to the other side, get your success, get to know who you are. Be much that beyond you your know, gender, so, much, much so, beyond. You know, yeah. I, I did. But then, then the problem is, is then trans people, well, where are they? You know, it's like, we walk amongst you, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, you're the trans person, you're sat there, someone's staring at you, you know, maybe it's because my hair's a bit weird or something like that. I think they're staring at me because I'm trans and, you know, and it's, it's really quite, you know, it's quite stressful because everyone's staring at me and, and stuff. Sometimes right. people just look at people, you know, that's what I've learned. Um, and um, and so, you know, people might 
uh, I might accidentally look at someone who's trans who I don't know is trans and then they're going to think I'm looking at them and then and I know and then or you see another trans person like how do you know you sort of know how do you say you know a, a, a trans friend of mine she, she said she was she was somewhere and she saw someone who she sort of knew was trans and and she just said something like oh you know um I know you're trans or something and I am too and the person turned to her and said oh I know <laughs> and then she was she was really embarrassed <laughs> because um but anyway anyway so I try to always wear this button like every single day so that's the point and I have my trans converse so so I you know once you kind of transition you disappear and then you're no longer a role model we don't have any trans role models because we disappear so you know I now recognize that it's really important for me yeah. to wear this Right. so that when anyone right. who's trans sees yeah. me, they see yeah, someone I, who's I, I love them. this, you know, you're really inhabiting this place of both, you know, you're not in shame anymore. You are proud. You are wearing it on your chest. You want to be a role model. Yeah. You're not hiding anything. It is part of who you are, but with a very deep clarity that it's just a part and that you're the fullness of your being is so much bigger than this one part of our identity. It's not a rejecting of it. It's just a, it's just a, a full understanding that nobody is just one part of their being and that you have to really understand that yeah. and inhabit that. Otherwise you are, you know, so limiting yourself and, 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 and that that's not a very vibrant place to be in life, right? It's, it's a narrow. Exactly. And, you know, what role model do I want to be? What right. activism do I want to do? You know, because I, I could be the angry trans person who's trying to get equality or I could do my best to be creative and successful as a scientist and, and right. who I am and what I do at that. And be, you know, out there doing that who just so happens to right. be trans, but doesn't really talk about it because it isn't really a thing. Like That's your that's activism. Absolutely. Activism. There's so many different ways to, to start transforming culture. There's definitely not only one way. Um, yeah. And, and when, I did, when I did the first TED Talk, uh, to, best, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the first trans woman, first out trans woman, I guess, to speak on the TED main stage. But right. I didn't talk about being trans. And for me, it was really important for me not to talk about being trans. It was for me to go on that stage and talk about my work, but who right. just so happens to be trans, you know, it's because, a, you know, I have, like, and that's, that's the activism. We need more of, of that. You know, if, if someone comes on to do a, a TED talk in a wheelchair, they're going to no. talk about being in a, like, no, this should be, you know, the, the person with one leg should right. be talking about their Right. Art or the science right. or discovering Same with, something. Same with you know or... books for children. They shouldn't be about being trans or what it is being trans. Like we just want a bunch of representation of different able body, different yeah. you know everything like and different uh, gender expression, etc. Like it just should be part of our reality versus what we talk about. I hear you. That's the next level. I was uh, exactly. curious to hear. Sorry. So those are the activists. Sorry. So, so those are the activists we need. So don't get lost in transition. Get to the other side and do your best to be as awesome as you can, at whoever you feel you are. Don't let anyone define you as to what you are. Be who you are. Be the best at that. Be awesome. Be out there and just be and be amazing. And that, that's the best it's form of activism. It's a beautiful message, yeah. Because you need those people who, who would think that they don't agree with someone being trans you need them to see you and wish that their kids <laughs> to be as awesome I hope my you. kids are half like, as half awesome as you. you I wish I was ha half as awesome as you you are <laughs> just a fabulous human being um I have a couple final questions because I don't want to uh, uh, take too much of your time although I could keep going um one is so 10 years later have you managed to reconnect with family and friends or is that just the past and that's something that you've turned the page on so with my fam with my family kind of yeah um I, and some of my issues with family were not to do with right. me being trans so that so, is what it is you know that with my family's my family's a bit odd so you know I have not seen my parents oh, for over 20 wow. years which is kind of sad um but my siblings have, have not you know that uh, we just all you know whatever it, it's not anything okay. sinister or anything it's just you know, sometimes life's too short to be, to be dealing with, 
<laughs> yeah, um, but but I have a great relationship with my sister, and I have a wonderful relationship with my niece, her daughter. Um, my niece is awesome. Um, when when my niece was sixteen, she I think it was sixteen. She quit school. Um, she was in school in Scotland. She flew to London. She met me in London. And then the following day, my niece and I flew to New York. She brought her guitar and we spent two weeks um, traveling around the USA and at different bars, restaurants, cafes. Um, she played 15 wow. gigs in two weeks um, in, in New York, the Bronx, Brooklyn, um, San Francisco um, and, and in L.A., um, and they were kind of, you know, just random things that my sister and I found for her to play. Um, she even played at the Bitter End in New York, which is, I think, one of the first places that Lady Gaga played, um, which was quite an amazing experience. And so, you know, so she's had her journey from being 14 of knowing that inside she's a musician. And, you know, she dedicated her life to doing that. And um, her, her name's B Charlotte and she's an awesome awesome musician and she was signed by Sony yeah. and in Germany and now she's that's great 23 and, or something, you, you, so. and your daughter you have a great relationship with your daughter she moved in with you so clearly yeah yeah my daughter, yeah she's 21 and you know she's she, she's just out <laughs> that's there great <laughs> so yeah so you've reconnected yeah. with the people that you wanted to have a relationship with so this this was this happened and yeah I never really never heard back from my friends or I don't have any relationship at all with wow. friends that I had before, you know, didn't have many friends, you know. Um, I mean, one of the things I realized that for my whole life, what I thought was my greatest weakness, which was who I am inside, turned out to be my greatest strength, you know, and that was an amazing thing that I realized when I realized that what I thought was my greatest weakness for my whole life turned out to be my greatest strength and when I could take what was inside me and allow that to come outside me and be everything as to who I am um I might have lost the two three four five friends that I have but I now have hundreds of friends I have friends I all over the so place much. You are so um and I'm so very, inspiring very it's it's amazing to me that you know, for those of us who don't have dramatic uh, coming of age story, right, like coming out and facing, you know, like uh, the shame of growing up yeah. different from, you know, quote unquote, the norm. It can be even harder to come into our own and to express our truth because we don't necessarily have to. We can live half lives and mediocre lives and not truly express, allow ourselves to shine because being our how we are is you know, we can pass through life that way. You know what I'm trying to say? But it's so inspiring when, yeah, when you know, see I'm people, right. you know, really going through that metamorphosis and having that courage and then being, you know, like you say, expressing their, 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 their who they are and shining. And then because of that, being able to make friends, yeah. it's like, oh, you know, I got to do this work. I got to, I got to have the courage yeah. also to, to fully inhabit myself, um, even though the, the the stake is not as as high, uh, it's still it's still necessary. Yeah, no, that makes that makes me feel very lucky. I feel very privileged and lucky to be trans. I feel very very lucky to have had this journey, you know. And you say it as a metamorphosis. I remember when I was a kid, I saw a little cartoon in a newspaper that was a, a fat hairy caterpillar looking up at a butterfly, saying. You wouldn't catch me ah, yep. one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, and I realize now, you know, I maybe I was a fat, hairy caterpillar, but now yes. I'm a beautiful butterfly. I have one. one oh, go ahead. Sorry, finish. Um, interrupting you. Well, also, you know, maybe this is not a nice thing, but maybe that's why back in the day in tribes and things, they would just send their children out at a coming of age time into the forest to find the white stag or whatever or take them out into the forest leave them and if they if they make it home then that's <laughs> great and if they don't then okay Ooh, tough love yeah um yeah so yeah. yeah this was some tough love but you know well, i'm grateful very grateful for, for it that. too that that you are here shining your light so bright i have one final question although like i said it's hard to stop um but when I was you when you were talking about your childhood, I had this question that popped up. Um, your your sister is uh, older or younger than you? Younger. Was she younger. also sent out to do all these 
things with the truck driver and with the drill and, you know, like, or did she stay put? Was she get given the same opportunities to explore? So she had a little bit of a different life, but I think yeah. also because she was younger. So Ooh, she was about five years yeah. younger. So, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah no, that's so a big I difference. Think, yeah, she I was a she was a, a a young kid, uh, younger than ten when you were a teenager, and uh, those opportunities, right? Yeah, so, so there's the age thing too, but there were, I I am sure there was a difference also, right. you know, based on gender, and you know, but my sister's also, you know, she's pretty awesome. Yeah. She's an inspiration. Because it's like me. when I when I think um, of there is something. And, sorry, so I keep interrupting you. Know, she, you. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's delayed for you. She, she, my sister does a lot of really awesome and interesting things. She connects with people who um, works with people who are alcoholics and homeless, whether they're on the street mm -hmm. or whether they're in prisons. Um, and she goes into the prisons and she works with these people and she she works with them to create and tell their stories. And she turns their stories into musicals. And then wow. th they that then perform in the musicals, so either in the prison awesome. wow, or in the community. Wow, that is so awesome. Um, yeah. The, so the, the conversation we're not going to have today, but maybe we're going to have to have it another time, is that one thing that came up for me was that when I listened to you, even when I listened to you going and spending time alone in the woods, or when I listened to you going to, you know, in the middle of nowhere, Australia and working there. And it's not to say that women don't do this. Women do this more and more, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm very close to your age and, you know, I, I grew up, like I told you, like in a kind of old fashioned environment, but I know women have done this and women, you know, are capable of all of this. It's also true. I think that, um, being a man makes that kind of, uh, things easier, uh, the expectation on us, the safety of doing it and whatnot. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of a something that I, I wonder and maybe an interesting conversation to have one day, like how did, uh, if there was some positive aspect and I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily true, but could there have been some positive aspect to have been given these opportunities, you know, being my, the same generation to do these things or to have given yourself the permission to do these things because you were perceived as male? Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah I I think so I mean I think so right, I mean it's, it's hard, it's hard because, to unpack it though right. isn't it because it's so hard to unpack it especially fun. because you were you know, getting I mean, also the the shame and not the expression like how do you, how do you <laughs> wait which one is you know it's not a really no I I you know I, yeah right. I was very unhappy so you know I was very unhappy very shameful um didn't think I would ever have any friends, didn't think I would ever find a partner. Um, yeah, so I, I was very, un, very unhappy. Um, you know, when you, you feel as though, you, yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, yeah. and it's hard, it's hard to unpick it yeah. for multiple reasons, you know, because there's that, there was massive privilege and maybe there was, right. you know, massive male privilege, but, but then, you know, living a life where my where I lived in different parts of the world is right. very, very it's unusual. Also, right. It's female. also another set of oh. privilege. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's my great, my greatest privilege is that I think to me is that my parents exposed me to a world that right. I thought someone like me can do something like that. And I think that is the thing we yeah. need to give to our children. You know, all children is exposure and experience and role models so that they can grow up believing they can be anything they want to be. You know, if they want to be that kindergarten teacher, then they can be Absolutely. the most awesome kindergarten teacher. If they want to be the astronaut, they can be the astronaut. But if they believe right. someone like that can't do that. Well, you know, I'm so worst. thankful for knowing you, for, for, for hearing your TED Talks, for talking to you today, and just for you shining your light so bright. I'm, I just, I just enjoy you so much and i'm so thankful for you so thank you for giving me that the time oh, of your day you. i'm going to stop the recording now thank you for being here and for listening we hope you are feeling inspired to share your own experience and reality if you like this video please share it you can follow us and hear about our latest video on facebook twitter and instagram and please subscribe to our youtube channel and remember that you are valued you are loved we see you